Thank you. It's good to be here. Look forward to uh, getting enough work done with uh, the, the collections of animal remains from the excavations that have been going on since I've, I had to get my memory refreshed here since 2002, I think, was the original excavations that took place out here. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, it's always been fun, kind of looking forward to uh, uh, pulling some of this together. And uh, last fall, when the uh, Midwest Archaeological Conference, which is the regional conference for professional archaeologists in, in the area, uh, those meetings were in East Lansing at Michigan State University uh, last I think it was last October, and um, so it was a, a, a Mark. Uh, Mark and I were talking about that it'd be good to talk about some stuff, and he said that he's been um, uh, doing some work with the artifacts, concentrating specifically on the Upper Mississippian, the late prehistoric uh, material from the site. And uh, so he uh, sent me the animal remains from the features that that were non-mixed, that were pure Upper Mississippian, uh, as, as best as we uh, can determine. And so uh, that's what we gave this presentation on. So, uh, like I said, up here, acknowledgments to Mark Schur, Joshua Wells, and Sarah Nixon, because what the presentation we gave at the, at the Midwest Conference, uh, this was all crammed into 15 minutes, and Mark did it, and, um, and his, so he's trying to get all this information in, and I had provided some slides and graphs to him and everything, and he could only use a, a, a few of them. And so I've been thinking, well, I'm not going to waste all these graphs and slides. I'll show them to, to you folks. And, and, and instead of concentrating on all the pottery and all the plants and everything, I'll talk, concentrate on the animal remains. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the artifacts as well. So anyway... Uh, I have to point out that this is actually a collaboration uh, with Mark and Joshua and Sarah, and they've all participated in this, but I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on the animal remains tonight. And I'm going to talk about a number of sites in addition to Collier Lodge, because it's my firm philosophical belief on doing faunal analysis on, on, on any one site. The only way you know or can appreciate the significance of it is by comparing it and contrasting it to other sites in the area, uh, contemporaneous sites. So that's what we're um, uh, going to concentrate on here. And so, uh, like I mentioned, Collier Lodge uh, and, and the site on the, the Kankakee River, um, northwest Indiana. And uh, as I said, this work's been going on for uh, over 10 years. And uh, uh, that's one of the things really acknowledge all the people who have volunteered to go out and, and do all the works, uh, go, all the work. And this is something that, uh, uh, whenever I've gone around and worked on other projects, uh, uh, Collier Lodge, when the work was going on, was always something that uh, people were becoming aware of. All, all the work was going on there because one or two years work, but then this went on and on and on, and so uh, uh, it's got quite a reputation around the Midwest. So you should be proud of yourself from that point of view. Uh, Kankakee, the Grand Kankakee Marsh, this is an area that I've long been interested in, even before I uh, got involved with Collier Lodge. And um, uh, as far as I'm, Collier Lodge is right about in this area, isn't it, John? Okay, right about in that. Okay. Um, I came across this slide the other day, and, and uh, uh, driving up last Friday, I was going up to East Lansing for some other meetings, and then to Saginaw yesterday, and, and uh, uh, driving up on Friday, uh, hearing all the rain that we had and everything, and I know some areas south of Chicago had as much as nine inches of rain, and I was kind of a little concerned. I was like, well, I wonder if the Grand Kankakee Marsh is back to its old, you know, uh, if there's going to be any flooded roads or anything, because I usually drive through Moments and go to 421, St. Pierre, and up, and, and uh, uh, you know, different times of the year, you can say, yeah, this looks like it used to be the Grand Kankakee Marsh. But I've always been fascinated in unique environments like this, especially that have been changed. And when you're looking at animal remains from an archaeological site, you really get a chance to see, you know, what the environment was like back, back when, whenever the group you're, you're studying uh, lived in a particular area. And I, I always think this is a great area to, uh, to do that because, uh, you know, when they were there, they were hunting and fishing and gathering plants. It, it should really reflect what was there in the, in the marsh. And uh, uh, like I said, we know from the commercial duck hunters and all the fishing that was going on in the area, uh, migratory 
sandhill cranes coming through and, and, and muskrats, as uh, people in uh, Fort Wyatnon refer to the muskrats there as muskrats. Uh, so this is a good opportunity to see what's, what's going on there in the, in the uh, prehistoric past. Um, and one of the things with Collier Lodge, uh, it's got so many different components there. It's, uh, so many different periods of occupation. Uh, we're talking about uh, some areas of the site, we've gotten artifacts that go back to the archaic period, so uh, a couple thousand years old. And then um, uh, we go into the, the uh, middle woodland periods, and then, but the, the biggest concentration seems to be with the upper, uh, upper Mississippian time periods in the 15th century. And then we've got fur trade occupations there, and then the even more recent. And unfortunately, in a lot of the archaeological excavations, you'll get a mixture of artifacts from all these time periods. Uh, and the animal remains, you know, they don't speak French or they don't speak American or they don't speak Algonquian, so you don't know what they come with unless they're associated with the artifacts. And so this is a nice opportunity looking at uh, uh, the prehistoric uh, uh, Upper Mississippian occupation. Now, I mentioned that uh, one of the first times I got involved with looking at uh, material from the Kankakee River, and I really got to appreciate uh, uh, the potential for this, is doing some work with the Windrose site, uh, which is in Kankakee State Park in Illinois. And this was a, uh, uh, a site that dates to the 18th, uh, 1820s, probably. It's a Potawatomi village site, uh, Potawatomi habitation site. And as more work has gone on, archaeologist Mark Wagner from Southern Illinois University, Carbondale, uh, he uh, did excavations on this as well, and uh, when I was working on the animal remains from this, that was one of the things that it turns out that um, this Windrow site is a popular name for it, but actually with more documentary work, we think Mark thinks that this is a, uh, uh, Mark Wagner thinks this is Main Pox Village. And Main Pox was a conservative Potawatomi leader, and so uh, very conservative, and uh, he was preaching to his followers that uh, uh, to get rid of the white men in, that, in, in this area, uh, should reject all the European goods, European foods, and go back to the traditional ways. And so uh, this was one of the things that was, it was really interesting. From 1820s, this habitation site, there were the only domestic animal remains from there. I think there was a horse tooth. And then there was a pig mandible that had been modified. It had a perforation removed out of the ascending ramus, and, and it was the same size as a, as a, a, a dice, that a Potawatomi Indians women's game. And um, so we don't know for sure, but anyway, domestic animals were not well represented there at all. It was primarily deer and uh, turtles and fish and, and wild uh, 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 birds, everything that was natural to the area. And so uh, that was really striking that, that, uh, to, to see that from an 1820s time period. And now, going to Collier Lodge, we're looking at, at early time period. And so we really get a, a good chance to see what's, uh, uh, what's in the area. And again, uh, location of the site and, uh, in Porter County. And view of some of the excavations back there. Units uh, excavated all around the, uh, uh, the historic structure there. And there's Mark in the uh, background here. But it's the Upper Mississippian uh, refuse pits, uh, roasting pits, and uh, Mark has been able to isolate uh, 15 of these and get radiocarbon dates from these. And then uh, the material, the, the artifacts, and the animal remains, and botanical remains for us to study. So that's what, what uh, we're talking about now. And, I'll point out, too, that this isn't a final study. This is kind of a progress report. And we did give a, a preliminary paper, like I said, last, uh, last fall. But this is uh, ongoing work. So uh, uh, we, we might find more things as we, as we go along and, and, uh, uh, with additional work and contemplation here. Um, one of the roasting pits, a cross section. And you can see the, all the material here in the, in the bottom. And the artifacts. There again, the animal remains associated with the artifacts, and uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, shell-tempered pottery here, uh, characteristic of the Upper Mississippian time period. Uh, the, uh, the chipstone tools, the projectile points there, uh, primarily uh, triangular points, which is uh, 
uh, earmark of the late woodland period and upper Mississippian, so um, uh, so-called Madison points. These are arrowheads, uh, not spear, spear points like we find in some of the earlier time periods, the big notched uh, spear points, and uh, scrapers down at the bottom. Anyway, so we've got good artifact representation with, uh, with these uh, particular pits that we were able to isolate. And uh, mention, you'll see a number of names of a number of these sites here, Fifield and Griesmer and uh, Anchor, Huber, Oak Forest. These are sites that uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about some of these a little bit more here. But the ceramics from Collier Lodge, uh, this is what we're finding, and this is a slide put together by Mark uh, showing uh, percentages, uh, trends, and the change of pottery decoration through time from these different sites. Uh, Fifield is the earliest. Grismer has an earlier component, a later component, and you can see on the graph here as, as you go to the, uh, to the right, the later time period there. So uh, even though these are 15th century, they're within, there's, there's a temporal depth within this time period. And so you can see the pottery at Collier Lodge where that picks up with some of the decoration. And uh, Mark has another slide here showing uh, uh, even more detail about some of the uh, uh, more detailed aspects of the decoration. Looks a little confusing here from, from all this. And I'm not going to go into this. This is something that Mark can, can talk about. But uh, anyway, you can see um, some of the different aspects that's going on with the, the study of this material. And we're tying the Collier Lodge, the, the component here, um, this Fisher-Huber type of material that we're finding uh, from this 15th century time period. This is related to the Oneota to the west. Oneota is, a, a, is an upper Mississippian, again, a larger cultural manifestation, and uh, has a, uh, the, the upper Mississippian that we see in the Chicago area is, is really probably an extension of this, uh, a local uh, extension of it, but, but uh, like I say, with the Fisher-Huber components uh, is what, what we talk about. And these are pottery types named after uh, particular sites. So uh, going on with that, and then, and then uh, I won't go on much about the, the plant remains because I don't know a whole lot about the plant remains except what uh, uh, Sarah provided information on this. is The, uh, the flotation samples here uh, produce mainly wood charcoal, and most of that, uh, the vast majority of that is oak. Uh, there's only one corn cupule fragment. So usually in these upper Mississippian sites, you'll find a lot more in the way of, of corn and when you do flotation and, and corn cobs, uh, but uh, not much here with, uh, with this component. Uh, a lot of disturbed habitat seeds, uh, naturally growing things in the area that were, were used, uh, some of them used as food sources. And uh, no evidence of what was roasted. We mentioned these big roasting pits and everything, and not much in the flotation samples to give us an indication. And uh, uh, Mark and, and Sarah suggesting perhaps pond lily was something that they were harvesting and, and roasting, and, and uh, uh, that doesn't leave much in the way of uh, remains and botanical samples. So that's, that's kind of a speculation that might be based on uh, uh, some ethnographic uh, analogy here. But the animal remains, we've got uh, uh, well over a thousand animal bones that were tied in with these, uh, with these uh, pits that we studied. Uh, 811 of those were, were identified. I'll point out a little bit of details of how we analyze these and, and, and how we measure them and, and do comparisons on these. So you can see on the left, NISP or NISP, as a lot of uh, uh, zooarchaeologists like myself would talk about. That stands for number of identified specimens. And so what that is is basically a, a raw frequency count of bone, teeth, shell that we identify in the screens. And when we get that sorted out, whatever we can identify. So we've got 811 specimens that we've identified. And this doesn't include all the little tiny fragments of mammal bone, fish bones, uh, turtle shell that we couldn't really say anything about. But 811 of these we've been able to identify more specifically than just mammal. We've been able to say at least a family of mammal or a family of birds, uh, and, and in many cases, uh, genus and species. So NISP on the one side, you can see um, we have in the, in the green reptiles, that's turtles, and then in purple, fish. Uh, 
little, little sliver there that we have of bivalves at the very top, and the, and the blue is mammals, and then that little sliver, sliver in red is birds. Now, the other thing you can do with, with the animal, animal remains that I prefer to do is that, okay, you, you present it, the, the, the bone counts and everything, but you can see if you're comparing a deer bone to a fish operculum from a little minnow, one and one, it's not exactly comparable. So one of the things to do is take the weight on everything. So projecting NISP weight by class, you can see where mammal bones makes up more of a, a, a majority of what we've got there by weight. And that's reflecting the fact we have deer and elk, black bear, some of the larger size animals in there. Uh, whereas the fish, you can see they're so um, uh, numerous in terms of specimen counts, but by weight, they, they don't make, that, make up that much by weight. So it's just different ways of, of uh, uh, projecting this to give you a, a, a better feel of species uh, presence and absence and importance. Um, that, another thing we try to do with the animal remains is, okay, so we've got all these specimen counts, but how many individual animals are represented by that? And MNI is minimum number of individuals. And this is usually done by taking, usually, usually uh, deer as an example, if you've got a, a, a right distal humerus, uh, and you find another right distal humerus, you know you've got at least two individual deer. And so you apply that across the board and look at what's the most frequent elements there, and that, that's how you come up with the minimum number of individuals from all the different species you've identified. And so this on uh, an MNI graph here on the left shows, again, the species importance by number of individuals. Uh, fish are abundant, number of individuals uh, uh, makes up a, uh, a little over a, over a third here, probably, just by individuals. And we've got a, a minimum of 130 individuals represented with just the identified animal bones. Then you take the, another way of, of projecting importance of, of uh, the various animal taxa there, is if you take the weight of the bone, and then you can apply some formulas on this to find out what, what we refer to as biomass. What is the amount of meat, uh, consumable meat, that, that uh, a, a native population could extract from these animals? And if you take a, a, the weight of the bone and apply these formulas, and it's different from mammals, it's different from birds, and then uh, each different family of fish has a different formula that you would apply there, and the same with turtles. So in terms of biomass, this is an estimate. You can see, again, mammals are much more important because they are bigger animals. And, uh, and, and you can just see that projected here in terms of biomass. So uh, different ways of projecting this information. And the graphs I'm going to show you from, from Collier Lodge and these other sites will have these different, different figures here. So uh, try not to confuse you on that, but, that, but the, it's different things that we're measuring in, in different ways here uh, with this. If we look at just the mammals from Collier Lodge from these upper Mississippian uh, pit features here, you can see, if we look at the most frequent mammals here, uh, deer is the best represented. And that's not really much of a surprise because uh, white-tailed deer is just about, you can, you can make a bet on whenever you go into a faunal assemblage with prehistoric uh, sites that white-tailed deer is going to be important. And how much more important it is, that's the story. And then the species diversity, what other species you're getting is, is another thing here. But so you can see deer, and a lot of, time, a lot of people are surprised that we get elk. But uh, elk were um, represented, and, and I think just about every site I've worked on in the Midwest, we've gotten elk to some extent or another. Right now, we're working on a site from, uh, from uh, near Dixon Mounds Museum called the Morton Village site, and we're getting a lot of elk there. And I don't know if that's a bias for just the, the collections we're looking at, and as we look at more collections, the elk will reduce down in number or, or what. But, uh, uh, some sites have more elk than others, and that, that's the question, what does, that, what does that indicate? So anyway, with, with uh, Collier Lodge, you can see in blue, in terms of number of specimens, number of bone fragments we've identified, deer makes up 60% of uh, all the mammal. And then uh, muskrat is the second most frequent, uh, just under 20%, and then we get a smattering of, of uh, other mammals represented in here. But here again, muskrat, kind of reflecting that marsh, swamp, habitat, uh, and again, otter, uh, raccoon is usually found uh, 
with, within these environments as well. So uh, one of the things that's surprising here is that these late prehistoric sites or proto-historic sites uh, often will find dog remains. And this was kind of surprising the other day when I was putting these graphs together uh, again and, and uh, noticed that there's no dog represented here. And, and that's, that's really odd for this time period because as you'll see when I show some of the other sites, dog is usually well represented. Uh, they're commonly used as food by the later uh, prehistoric people. And I often you know, point out that uh, when Marquette and Joliet came down the Mississippi River to the Des Moines River and they came in contact with the first Illinois Indians and it was a big village of Peoria. And uh, uh, when they came in and, and they were hosted and uh, they, they served up dog, which was uh, 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 food uh, you know, for guests. And Marquette was saying, um, no, we don't eat dog. And uh, I think Joliet was a little, oh, no, <laughs> we're going to offend the Illinois Indians. and They might eat us. <laughs> but uh, the, the Indians accepted that and everything. And, but uh, like I said, dogs are commonly consumed in these later prehistoric sites. And I've seen this on, on a lot of uh, sites. So, uh, but dog has not, not been uh, present. I, I, it's probably just a sample bias here that we haven't come across any uh, with, with these particular pits, but uh, it's noteworthy that we don't have any dog in, in the Collier Lodge. Something that's surprising, if we look at the bird remains. Now, bird remains are underrepresented, and this is a common situation. A lot of times people think it's because bird bones are fragile, they don't represent as well, but that's not, it's not just the f how fragile bones are, because if you look at bones from Canada geese, turkey, trumpeter swans, I mean, they're, they're pretty rugged, and uh, they, they, they preserve quite well. Well, what we've got with Collier Lodge are our upper Mississippian samples. We've got, we've got ducks, we've got Canada goose, but most of the birds we're identifying out of here are wild turkey. And so it shows that they're, they're, they're going after terrestrial uh, birds anyway. And perhaps this is a reflection of seasonality. Maybe ducks and geese weren't migrating through at the time when the site was inhabited. And so they're going after wild turkey and they're, they're getting ducks and geese, but they're not the big migratory flocks coming through. And uh, so perhaps this is what this, what this represents. Anyway, turkey is, is uh, uh, by far the most important bird and most commonly uh, encountered bird at the site. Fish, uh, well, bowfin. Uh, it's not what, what, what we would think of as something that's really good and savory, but uh, uh, bowfin shows up on a lot of these sites as the number one fish species. And uh, uh, as we can see at Collier Lodge, bowfin is by far and away number one, and the others that, that we see quite a, quite a few remains of, but nothing rivaling uh, uh, bowfin in, in terms of importance quanti quantity-wise. Gar, northern pike, and bullheads. Bullheads are your small variety of catfish, and so all of these reflect uh, this kind of marsh, marshy, still water environment. And um, so this is, this is what we're finding. A uh, minimum of 39 individual fish uh, broken down into these groups. Uh, this is the, the majority of them. Turtles. Just about every kind of turtle that you can find in the area was represented here. Um, and what's, what's kind of interesting here is that uh, uh, the diversity of turtle we're getting. Now, in blue on the far right, we'll see under, under pond slash box turtle. These are fragments that we can't distinguish as to what species they are. We know they're the, they're the family of pond turtles or semi-aquatic turtles, and that would include slider, painted turtle, Blanding's turtle, uh, and so these are fragments of, of those, but uh, they don't calculate into minimum number of individuals because we, we don't know what species they are. Uh, they're probably smaller fragments of Blanding's turtle, painted turtle, slided, slider, and perhaps some box turtle as well. Box turtle is terrestrial, and what we're getting is probably eastern box turtle. Um, but uh, Blanding's turtle tends to be the most uh, common thing we get there. We get some snapping turtle, but it's interesting, even stink pot. Now, I don't know how often any of you have come across stink pots or little musk turtles. Usually when you see musk turtles, when I've seen them is when I've been in a canoe and I've seen them swimming around a log and they're going the other way. And they're really uh, 
elusive, they're secretive, they're hard to get, and so they're probably netting these somehow, or they're probably netting other fish, and maybe some of these stink pots are coming up in the turtles. But they're called stink pots because they, they, they give off an odor. And uh, so uh, anyway, they're, they're even represented here. So uh, every kind of turtle that they can, they can get their hands on, uh, one way or the other, is showing up at uh, Collier Lodge. If we take all these different taxa and we you know, rank them in terms of the most important, regardless of class, what we're seeing is grouping all the turtles together. That's um, uh, in terms of uh, another measure I'm throwing in here in green, uh, ubiquity. Ubiquity is a, a term that we use for, you do this without any kind of artifacts, but we do this with faunal analysis sometimes, just to uh, look at the number of samples, in this case the number of features that have that taxa represented. So it's a presence absence. Um, all turtles, they're represented in 90% of the samples here. Uh, we're getting some turtles. A uh, little over 80% we're getting both in. And then on down, deer, a little over 60% of the features. Uh, muskrat, uh, turkey, so you can see the percentage is in the green, what's most uh, abundant there. Elk, we're finding it in, in uh, uh, less than 20% of all the features. So we're getting it, but it, it's not well represented amongst all, the, uh, all the, the, the samples that we're looking at. So there again, ubiquity uh, is another measure of importance there. Even, even if it's just a couple of fragments and if it's represented in almost every sample, you know that's, that's a, a certain measure of importance there. Um, but turtles, again, you can see from the blue, they're really common, both in and then on down. Uh, but uh, deer, muskrat, turkey, otter, elk, uh, turtles, bowfin, muskrat, otter, again, all aquatic. So they're representing the marsh habitats real well. Um, so th these, these species here that I've got ranked here, this represents 93% of all the bones we've identified or accounted for by these particular species and then 74% of the individuals, and 96% of the biomass that we calculate. So what does all this mean? How significant is this? How unique is this? Well, if we go back and we look at a couple of the other sites that uh, are well known in the area, the, the Grismer site and the Fifield site, um, these were uh, sites that were worked on by, um, uh, re reported on and studied by Charles Faulkner, and this was published back in 1972, and it seems like Everything that comes out of northwest Indiana is compared to these, uh, to these two sites because of this report. And uh, here's Faulkner. I found some, some photos of Faulkner. Uh, 1958 when he was at the Angel Mounds Field School and then later on uh, just before he retired at University of Tennessee. Um, but uh, I think as I understand it, with the, this, this report that he published on Grismer and Fifield was a, a master's thesis project of his. He had contacted Paul Parmalee at the Illinois State Museum where I'm at to identify the animal remains. And so there's a, 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 an appendices to these reports, uh, one on the Grismer site, one on the Fifield site. And so I'm um, able to take all the, the figures that he presents in, in those reports to make some comparisons to Collier Lodge. So a little bit about Grismer site. This is uh, just downstream some. And uh, again, you see the, the importance they didn't, he, uh, Parmalee didn't take weights on that, and didn't calculate biomass, but uh, from this tables you've got number of identified specimens, minimum numbers of individuals. And again, what you, this is pretty similar to Collier Lodge in the, the abundance of, of, of turtles, the abundance of fish, and uh, uh, the proportion of mammals here. Uh, this is pretty, pretty comparable to uh, uh, Collier Lodge. And if we look at the dominant taxa from Grismer, um, Again, looking at the most important, we're seeing turtles, well represented, both in well represented, just like Collier Lodge. Here's deer. And then we've got muskrat, we've got catfishes. Catfishes would include bullheads, in addition to channel catfish. Uh, we've got beaver, and then the suckers uh, that he's got at the end, that includes red horse and buffalo fish. But I think it's uh, primarily red horse, and that's what we get at, at uh, Collier Lodge amongst the uh, uh, suckers that we've got there. Oh, let's see, one thing I was going to point out. No birds amongst the dominant taxa. So this is similar, again, to Collier Lodge in that birds are underrepresented for whatever reason. And uh, 
at least at Collier Lodge, we had turkey showing up amongst some of the dominant taxa, but uh, uh, this is a larger sample uh, and, uh, in terms of number-wise, and birds don't even show up amongst this. And then if we look at uh, some of these in terms of, of uh, the dominant taxa, same, same things represented uh, primarily. And then at the end, you can see canid. And canid is a conservative way of, of saying dog, because that could include wolf, it could include uh, coyote, but these are probably all domestic dog. It's just, you, it, it's virtually impossible to distinguish uh, coyote from dog from wolf, except from size. And when you get large dog and a small wolf, and you know, then you, you can't tell them morphologically. So, uh, so anyway, we do have canid, which is probably dog. Uh, and then there's also squirrel, mink, and bobcat, and point out down at the bottom. Uh, birds, a different, somewhat different uh, picture here. We've got Canada goose, pied bill grebe amongst uh, the more important birds. I also got bittern, rail, I combined those from the tables, and wild turkey is there, but these other aquatic birds are, are much more ab abundant at Grismer. So uh, uh, perhaps this is a, a, another seasonality factor, a migratory birds coming through. Uh, so, but they, again, they don't show up amongst the dominant taxa from the site, and so this is a story within itself, but it, overall these aren't, aren't that, that uh, significant in the overall subsistence pattern at the site. Look at fish, uh, very similar, both in, catfish including uh, both in, or uh, including bullheads, and then we've got northern pike, suckers, and, and everything else, black bass, walleye, uh, centricas like bluegills and sunfish. So both in again, uh, dominant, and then uh, catfish and bullheads uh, next most. So a, a similar kind of a story here. Uh, turtles, everything again represented, uh, even stink pot in the Grismer uh, site. Uh, we even got a little bit of soft shell on the very end here. We haven't picked up any soft shell at uh, Collier Lodge yet that I, that I recall. If we did, it's only one or two pieces. Uh, Fifield site. Um, not on the Kankakee, it's to the north, and uh, this is quite a bit different. You can see how important mammals are at this site. So there is, there is something different going on here. Turtles and fish, hardly any fish represented at, at Fifield. Uh, it's contemporaneous, uh, it's on the early end, but it's, it's generally contemporaneous. It's another 15th century uh, site, uh, early to mid 15th century. The dominant taxa, deer, dog, turtles, and then we get a smattering of, of other things. Uh, one of the things to point out with, with Fifield that's interesting is that even when all the taxa are combined, you take all the fish and put them together, uh, they don't even show up in significance amongst all these top seven. So something very different is going on at Fifield site. Um, mammals, point out one of the things that's interesting here, we've got bison represented here at Fifield site, and dogs are more important than at any of the other, uh, either of the other two sites. And birds, something that's interesting with birds, we're getting wild turkey, the, the dominant taxa here, so it shows, you know, kind of reflects this importance of terrestrial exploitation here. But look at hawks and raptors, the second most frequent. There's a whole variety of hawks that, uh, 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 hawks and falcons that, that Parmley identified for Fifield site which is, is interesting. Uh, that doesn't show up on, on uh, either Collier Lodge or, or Grismer site. And then uh, fish, uh, what fish there are, both in is the most important, but uh, then we're seeing black bass and northern pike. Turtles, uh, turtles aren't all that, all that abundant, but we're, we get a pretty good representation. Snapping turtles is more common here, uh, and then the indistinguishable pond turtles. And then, I'm gonna go a little bit west. Another big project I've been working on for um, um, the Illinois State Archaeological Survey, which used to be ITARP, a, a transportation research program in Illinois, um, is at the uh, Hoxie Farm site, down at the bottom here on the left. Hoxie Farm is one of a group of sites in, in the Chicago area, Anchor, Oak Forest, Huber, Palos, and there again, you saw those on some of those other graphs early on, we were talking about the, the different ceramics. Um, so these are, these are uh, 
again, Fisher, Huber cultural groups with the same, similar, very similar kinds of pottery. And there's temporal differences amongst these, but there's a lot of overlap as well. So anyway, I've been doing work with the Hoxie Farm site, and um, this is a view of the Hoxie Farm site. This is a very complex site. Uh, we've got the, the different components there that we've been able to isolate. The archaeologists in, in Champaign have been able to isolate a late Fisher and Huber. And then all the others that are in white uh, refer to as Upper Mississippi, and we can't distinguish from the ceramics. There's a mixture of ceramics, so they, they're, they're just uh, a mixture of all of this. But you can see uh, in the blue, the outline there, a longhouse represented. All these are uh, post moles up in this area. So there's a longhouse there, and there's, there's uh, uh, I think this is another disturbed area of, of probably a longhouse as well. Uh, but anyway, more than 2,000 features have been uh, uh, excavated from this site. And I've identified animal remains from, let's see, what is it now? 960 features uh, out of these. And I'm, I'm trying to wrap this up with the, with the Hoxie Farm and a, a lot of small samples, but some of them are pretty good size as well. So anyway, it, this is a, a, a big component here, a very complex site. And so I'll show you what, what we're finding with uh, Hoxie Farm a little bit. And I'm not going to go into as much detail, but with the fish, uh, again, both in another situation here, both in catfish, most of the catfish is bullheads again. So another example of this aquatic adaptation to these marshes and slow moving streams. This isn't big river uh, situation, but there's a lot of marshes here. And, uh, and that's, that's what we're seeing well represented with this. We get more diversity with the fish. We get some drum and pike and, and some other things. But uh, again, primarily bowfin and, and bullheads. Um, the mammals, we're getting uh, muskrat, beaver, um, deer, of course. But look how important dog coyote remains are. Uh, they, they show up a lot more here at this site than, uh, than any of the others. And then uh, point out down here, uh, we do get elk. We get bison at uh, Hoxie Farm. And what's interesting with bison is if you look at what skeletal portions are represented to see, well, the question is, are they hunting bison locally? Uh, did they get into the Chicago area, or were they going, traveling farther afield and hunting bison and bringing back selective portions? But look at what's in red here, scapulas. And so there seems to be a real bias towards scapulas for some reason. Uh, and then the other thing down in, in the upper Mississippi and late Fisher components here that we're seeing uh, with the bar graphs, uh, these are bones from the feet. These are toe bones primarily. Uh, ankle bones, toe bones, and wrist bones, and scapulas. But the uh, vertebra, uh, proximal hindquarters, uh, uh, the, the proximal um, uh, forequarters, cranial fragments, not well represented at all. It, the story here with bison is uh, you, can, you can almost make a bet. If you find bison, what is it going to be? It's going to be likely to be scapula. And what we think is going on here is that the selective use of scapulas from bison to use as tools. Uh, got several good examples of bison scapulas perforated. They've removed the spine uh, here, and they've sharpened this, uh, removed some of this bulk along here to, man to uh, uh, modify into agricultural implements like these hoes down here shown, shown on the bottom. So this is an example of uh, what we think they were using the scapulas for. But again, the question is, how far were they getting these bison? Did they have, were, were they Herds local or, or what? And, and why is it so biased towards, uh, towards scapulas? Is it just exclusively the tool use or what? And so this is uh, one of the questions that we're, we're looking at and uh, uh, kind of come, come to grips with. One of the things that's interesting is that elk is also very large. And, uh, and, and we've got scapulas from elk at, at Hoxie Farm. But if we look at a, a, another uh, a graph like this for skeletal portions of elk, it's well balanced. We're getting scapula is just one of all the other elements. It's not, it's not being selectively used for tools like, like the case with bison. So if, if I had to make a, uh, an interpretation of that, I would say they're, they're hunting elk locally without any, any question. But the bison, that's more problematical to, to uh, interpret. 
Uh, it, right now it looks like no, they're probably going farther afield and bringing back most of the scapulas to use as tools. But that's, uh, that's, that's hy hypothetical right now. Hoxie farm in terms of the birds, something that's interesting we, with the uh, waterfowl, this is a combination of swan, geese, and ducks under the waterfowl. And aquatic birds next to that, these are primarily American coot. And I've never seen so many American coot bones represented in a faunal assemblage as, as we're getting here. So again, combined, uh, waterfowl and aquatic, we're really seeing a, g a good representation that, uh, that they're concentrating on a, uh, the local marsh uh, habitats near Hoxie Farm for, for a lot of their, uh, for a lot of their, their uh, food. And it's well represented here with birds. So conclusions here, what we're looking at, we've got Collier Lodge, faunal assemblage, it's Comparable to the Grismer site, reflecting both marsh, uh, and both of these sites ref, re, reflect some kind of marsh adaptation. Uh, they're going after marsh resources, taking advantage of the Kankakee Marsh for, uh, for what animals are there. Uh, fish and turtles are similar, both in Blanding's turtle at Collier Lodge, both in and snapping turtle at uh, Grismer site. Uh, and, uh, and we can also put in here Hoxie Farm, a lot of similarities with Hoxie Farms as well. Mammals, uh, aquatic species are well represented. Muskrat, beaver, otter, uh, and, and raccoon, if you want to group them with the aquatic species, they're more general. Uh, low, low frequency of waterfall at, at both sites. We get more at Grismer than, than we do at Collier Lodge, and perhaps this is a, a factor of seasonality. Fifth field site, far different situation. That looks like a fall-winter occupation where they're going after terrestrial game, not, not going after uh, uh, aquatic. Um, things to, uh, they're concentrating on terrestrial resources. And then um, in, in more general, Collier Lodge is a relatively early occupation in northwestern Indiana. Uh, late Fisher, early Huber is a good characterization of, of that. Um, the site is primarily used for marsh resources during the warm seasons, what we would conclude both from the plant remains and the animal remains. Uh, and again, uh, pointing out that maybe these big roasting pits were uh, uh, used for roasting uh, uh, lily tubers, pond lily tubers. Uh, the known, low, known site density uh, looks like these groups at Grismer, Collier Lodge, and Fifield as well, that these are, uh, these are small groups, uh, seasonally different. Uh, Grismer and, and Collier Lodge, they're, they're there for going after the marsh resources. But it looks like they're smaller groups. In contrast to Hoxie Farm, that looks like a situation that these are larger groups that are coming back um, and using these sites over and over and over again, and probably larger, larger groups there at any one time, uh, based on the abundance of pottery that's, that's at those sites. So uh, that's giving us a picture uh, based on th things from these sites, uh, primarily from the animal remains. But uh, uh, that's, what's, that's what I really enjoy working on these sites with different uh, different collaborators with different archaeologists is to uh, look at the artifacts, what kind of pottery is represented, how tight are the, the components and the occupations, what kind of stone tools are represented there. Uh, do the stone tools go along with this kind of interpretation? Is there anything unique or, or is it stone tools is using the same tools to go after marsh resources as they do terrestrial resources? So these are all things that uh, we like to coax back and forth with one another as we're, as we're doing these uh, uh, these projects. So these sites here, Collier Lodge is uh, right in the realm of, of all these sites that uh, over the next uh, several years as more and more reports come out, uh, this, this is, this is the, the, the research universe that uh, Collier Lodge is coming along with. So anybody have any questions, I'll be happy to uh, try to answer anything or scratch my head and uh, figure out what, <laughs> what could be represented as well. So. Yeah. When you talk about the dogs versus coyotes or wolves, mm -hmm. are they able to distinguish between them, or are they all You need you need a whole skull to to distinguish uh, coyote from dog from from wolf, and uh, uh, usually what we've got is postcranial and maybe some isolated teeth. Usually, when I've been able to identify wolf, it's it's the, the it's the teeth are huge on on wolves, and then again, all the identifications we do is we take, take uh, animal remains and compare those to 
reference skeletons at the Illinois State Museum in our, in our uh, skeletal collection. We have o over 11,000 whole or partial skeletons of, of animals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish. So uh, that's, our, that's our comparative base as we compare all these fragments. But unfortunately, dog, coyote, uh, uh, and, and wolf, when you get partial bones, and it, it's usually just size. If you get a whole skull, then you can, do, you can say uh, one or the other. But now there's even a big, big controversy about, uh, uh, you know, are, are dogs really, I think there's some scientists that are, that are saying dogs are classified as wolves because they're, they're, they're domesticated versions of wolves and they're, you know, with all the different crossbreeds and everything. But so that the genetics of this is really, really uh, uh, an interesting and complex question as well. And there's whole groups of people that are working on that question. And, and uh, so a lot of times with dog remains, uh, I'll make sure they're isolated and take measurements and everything and then say, uh, come on over and take a look and see what you can figure out. You know, the what, people who specialize just on, on dogs and wolves and coyotes. Yeah? What do you think about herons or cranes? Uh, there's not a whole lot of meat on, on cranes and, and herons. Um, I've always been amazed when I've prepared skeletons of those. There's hardly anything to those. Once you pluck them, there's, there's not much there. Even the breast meat on a heron, there's not much there. And uh, uh, you do get them some, but they're, they're not something that they concentrate on because I think because there's not much meat on them. And, they, they, you know, and then the other question is, with, with Native Americans when they're exploiting birds, are they exploiting them for the meat or are they going after them for the feathers? And a lot of times, if you'll, you'll find certain bones that'll be wing bones, and then you'll make the interpretation, and Parmalee has done this for a number of sites, that uh, you'll get swan wing bones, and primary, maybe that's because they're going after the, the, the wing bones from the swan and the, the feathers uh, for artifacts and you know, for our articles of clothing and decoration. So that's another thing. We can identify the bones, but you know, does that, does that uh, represent food or use of feathers? Yeah. Yes. Well, there, the Hoxie Farm is uh, I-80 where the uh, used to be a service plaza. I think there's still a service plaza that goes over. That's, uh, that's where the road work was going on. Uh, they were doing excavations there from 2002, and I haven't driven through that area because of all the road construction. But uh, uh, that's where that site is. It's Thornton, Thornton, uh, Illinois, right on the I-80. And it's it's just, uh, just before you get to the big open quarry site. So it's just east of there. Uh, and that's, that site, the Hoxie Farm site, has been known for, for literally decades. And there's a lot of uh, collections, a lot of amateurs were, were there uh, collecting and excavating at the site um, when, the, when the highway first went in there uh, decades ago. And so they knew that site was there. And then when, so when they were planning on doing uh, work with the interchanges and everything there and widening it out, uh, they knew that was going to be a major uh, point of excavation, uh, mitigation for archaeology, and so that's what uh, what uh, the Illinois transportation archaeologists out of Champaign worked on. And like I said, they did excavations there from it's early, early 2000s, uh, three or four years of excavations there. And so that's why we've got so much material, because uh, um, they, they were trying to salvage that before the road work went on. Anything else? Yeah. Are the animals things have are they consumed and they find scrapings on the bones? In the historic ways they do they are they eaten for horn or can you say? Sometimes you can. Some if if you you know, we record cut marks and things like that. But uh uh and I can't remember with Collier Lodge, it doesn't stand out much in a way of modified bones in terms of artifacts. You know, sometimes you'll get awls and you'll get um, different kind of bone tools, uh, tools that are made out of, uh, out of the bones. And I don't know if that's because maybe Mark and Josh, when they were going through sorting out things, that they'd already sorted out bone artifacts 
but I didn't come across much in the, in the uh, unmodified, so-called unmodified things to, to see artifact uses out of them. So um, we look at skeletal portions, you know, what parts of the bodies are represented there to, you know, and, and make comparisons with that. But um, a lot of this is, is, you know, what was used for food. It's like with the, the question between meat and f uh, use of feathers with birds. You're assuming them they're, they're, they're hunting them and they're using for, for meat. And that's why you're seeing turkey and geese and swan well represented because they have a lot of meat on those. Whereas herons and dicky birds and, you know, some of the songbirds and everything, they're, they're not bothering with those unless they're probably getting those for feathers for special uses. Hmm. Yeah, I don't remember. And there again, if if we did, those might have been those might have been used for antler points or flint napping tools. But I don't. Re I didn't get any amongst amongst these. Now maybe maybe Mark has got some that that they separated out with the artifact categories. And they, see that that's again these are things that when we do final results on all these. Uh, uh, you know, these are the kind of questions we're always asking. Well, gosh, I didn't see any artifacts there. Oh, that's because we set those all aside. Or, or else I might be writing up some of the modified bones and forget to ask them if they'd pulled uh, modified bones from the, from the analysis. So these are things that we're, we're always going through and different archaeologists treat it differently. Sometimes they want me to just talk about all the, all the modified bone in, in addition to the food remains. Sometimes not. Depends on who I'm working with, how they do, deal with that. Yes? Um, when you were talking, someone asked a question about the location of the hospital arms and mm -hmm. like that. But where is Highfield? Uh, Highfield is yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. John, you know if Highfield, Greismer, if that's correct pronunciations? I've just read those reports and I, 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 I don't know exactly how the families pronounce their names, but they're. They're, um, they're named after property, you know, private, um, you know, somebody named Fifield, somebody named Greismer. Yeah, I'm trying to determine if that's actually in Porter County or if it's in the Fort County. Ah, uh, well, let's see. Go back on that report to see. I don't remember. Doesn't, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, Fifield, I think, is, is farther up north. But Grismer is, is on the Kankakee. And I remember when uh, early on, Mark was making references to, to Grismer site, some of the, the ceramics. Yeah. Yeah, I'd have to look. I have to look at the, get the get the site numbers on that to see exactly what counties uh, both of those are in. And I, I didn't. There is a book written on archaeology of Porter County. You can only find like a reference outside where I can't even make it. Well, there again, these, this Faulkner's report here has has got the details on on uh, both of these sites. And as I'm trying to remember, I think both these sites had been excavated previously and, and Faulkner wrote these up for a master's thesis. I think both of these sites had been previously excavated. So they, uh, even though the report was published in 72, I think, the, I think the material had been out of the ground long before that. And he did that for a master's thesis project. 